Trying to manage your AWS costs? It can often feel overwhelming and you may struggle to figure out where to start. And for good reason, there's over 200 different AWS services, all with slightly different pricing models, and it can be difficult to know how to optimize cost for each one. For many, cost ends up becoming an afterthought that only comes up once your application is in production. Now, over the past eight years of working with AWS, I faced my fair share of challenges grappling with my cloud bill. I've also learned a bunch of simple actions that you can take to ensure you're not spending more than you need to. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you my top five cost optimization tips that every AWS user should know. These tips will apply regardless if you're a beginner to AWS or maybe even someone with more experience that isn't yet very cost conscious. But before that, this video is sponsored by Cast AI. Cast AI is an essential tool for anyone using Kubernetes to host your infrastructure. A couple lines of code lets you take advantage of Cast's auto suggestions for instance types that best match your usage and workload. Cast uses artificial intelligence behind the scenes to figure out the correct instance type and size at that particular moment. Their tool also supports spot instances that can be used to achieve even more savings. Cast AI has an easy to use and intuitive dashboard that lets you assess comprehensive metrics on your cluster along with any cost savings opportunities. If you're a Kubernetes user, I'd highly suggest to give Cast AI a try. You can use the link in the description section below for a free trial. All right, so let's get started by counting down and starting with number five. Right-sizing your workload is the process of matching the infrastructure you provision with the workload requirements of your application. The goal of right-sizing is to eliminate waste by using the right type of infrastructure that will minimize cost while at the same time not compromising application performance. Right-sizing as a concept applies to many AWS services, but the way you apply it can differ depending on which service you're working with. So let's take a look at two examples across different areas. For compute services like EC2, the right-sizing lever that we have at our disposal is instance type. To optimize costs, we should look at a metric like the existing CPU utilization, memory usage, and network bandwidth of our instances. You should generally try to keep your average utilization at around 80% of capacity. If your utilization across any of these metrics are low, it may indicate it's time to drop down the instance type or select a more suitable instance class for your application. For storage services like S3, there are a multitude of different storage classes at our disposal. This includes general purpose, infrequent access, Glacier, and more. Each of these storage classes offer different performance, availability, durability, and of course, cost. Right-sizing for this category would involve evaluating the needs of your application and picking the right type. For example, general purpose mode is great for frequently accessed data that require high levels of durability with low and reliable latency. Glacier, on the other hand, is a fraction of the cost and has performance characteristics that make it better suited for data archiving use cases. The key takeaway is that the steps you take to right size will be different depending on which service you're working with and a combination of performance, availability, and durability needs of the service. However, the simple principle still stays the same. Pick the option that minimizes cost and allows enough application headroom to function. Egress and ingress refer to data transfers across network boundaries. This can be data that's moving across internal networks or even data that's moving through the public internet. In AWS, charges can apply when data moves across certain network boundaries. It's important to be aware of when charges may apply so that you can avoid them if possible, or at a minimum, factor them into your budget when you're working on a new project. Here are a couple important ways that AWS charges for data transfers that you should be aware of. First is data transferred between AWS and the public internet. For uploading to AWS, no charges apply, but for moving data out of AWS through the public internet, be prepared to pay. What makes this even more complicated is that the amount that you do pay is dependent on which AWS service you're using. For example, to transfer data out of your S3 bucket to your home machine via the public internet, it would cost you approximately nine cents per GB for the first 10 terabytes. So if you have one terabyte to retrieve, you're looking at about $90 in data transfer costs alone. 
Next is data that is transferred across AWS regions. Regions are general locations of a collection of different AWS data centers in a particular geography. Some of the popular ones include US East 1, US West 2, and EU West 1. Cross-region transfers are sometimes encountered when users try to ensure better durability by replicating their data into another AWS region. Despite being a good idea in principle, this can end up costing you. Costs are dependent on the source and destination regions, but generally, you're looking at a couple of cents transferred per GB on average. Finally, data moving between different availability zones but within the same region is also charged. This can sometimes occur when an application hosted in one AZ is attempting to communicate with another component, say a database, in another AZ. For this type of scenario, you would be charged one cent per GB in each direction for your component. This may not sound like a lot, but bulky and frequent database queries can quickly result in a lot of data transfer costs, so buyer beware. My next tip for you is to leverage data retention policies whenever possible. This typically means to set up some kind of timed migration to move your data either from one service to another or by using a different storage classification that has better cost options. Where I've seen this bite particularly hard is with CloudWatch logs. CloudWatch logs charge a mind-boggling 50 cents per gigabyte. Now with any high throughput or chatty application, this can easily end up costing an arm and a leg. An easy mitigation is to use the migration policies that CloudWatch provides. Using this method, you can easily configure your log groups to be archived to something more affordable, like Amazon S3, after a predetermined period of time, say two weeks, one month, or even a year. This way, you can keep only your most recent logs in CloudWatch while moving less important logs to longer term storage options like S3 or Glacier. My next tip for you is to leverage the AWS pricing calculator. This tool is provided by AWS for free and makes it easy to get a rough idea of how much an application will cost before you ever begin developing. You can use it for any AWS service and create hypothetical estimates based on your specific usage to get a better idea of how much your application will cost. For example, in this clip, here I am creating a pricing plan for Amazon S3 and viewing the estimated cost breakdown at the bottom. I've used this tool many, many times and I can't say enough positive things. Be sure to leverage it for any upcoming project. This last tip is arguably the most important, and oddly enough, it's one that is most often overlooked. This tip is to design your applications with cost in mind. A disturbing trend that I've been noticing lately is developers designing entire application architectures without considering cost. It's only when the application is designed and ready to be implemented to folks run the numbers and try to produce a cost estimate. This is a surefire way to run into some nasty surprises that can be hard to undo. I need to say that this is without doubt the wrong way of doing things. In my opinion, cost consideration should be applied at the design phase. This is so that any quirks in how AWS charges you are accounted for and a different, more cost-effective solution can instead be proposed. It's important to remember that a service or feature that looks attractive at face value can sometimes be ridiculously expensive for your particular use case. So be sure to be cost conscious while you're designing to avoid any surprise bills. Now, an easy way to implement this in real life is to require a cost section for any design document. Having a dedicated discussion on cost estimates show that the author put thought into cost effectiveness and the potential for alternative options. It also gives reviewers an opportunity to identify any gaps or red flags that may not have been considered by the design author. I found that this tip is an easy mechanism that helps develop a culture where cost is at the forefront alongside design and implementation details. So I hope you enjoyed these top five tips. Let me know down below in the comments which tip you think is most important in terms of cost and any important ones that you think I may have missed. Thanks so much and I'll see you next time.